Lord, the only thing better than doing it once is doing it twice on Sunday morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of worship. Thank you for your word as we open your word. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, before you say hello, zeal. If you are middle school age, right out this door and out to the zeal house. So as we greet one another, follow the zeal. If you are zeal age. All right, say hello. How many of you? Um, how many of you know who Jimmy Fallon is? You know who Jimmy Fallon is? Okay, most people. But see, even the young people know who Jimmy Fallon is. How many of you know who Arsenio Hall is? See, all the old people still raise their hands. <laughs> Arsenio Hall was the Jimmy Fallon uh, back in the day, and he's still traveling and he's doing comedy. Um, and one of our own, uh, you might know her as Juanita Lolita, is opening for Arsenio, Arsenio Hall this week, this coming week. In Sarasota, Friday and Saturday, stand Miss Juanita. Some of you stand right around her. Come on, stand right around her. All right. Lord Jesus, make her funnier than ever. <laughs> for your sake, for your glory, for your kingdom. And Lord, we thank you for the doors you're opening for Juanita. And what a great door to be a witness for Jesus, Lord. Go before her and Lord, guard her. And Lord, as she opens her mouth, may the Holy Spirit <laughs> give her what she needs to say both on the stage and off of the stage. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Arsenio Hall. <laughs> Joshua, chapter 5. The Israelites are on the west side of the Jordan River. They are standing in the land of promise. Uh, they have experienced the miraculous. And yet, before going any further and uh, seeing the first place of real victory in the land of promise, which is a place called Jericho, uh, God has uh, commanded that they submit to circumcision. All the men who were not circumcised in the wilderness wandering, uh, now they would be circumcised. We covered that last week. Um, circumcision, spiritually speaking, speaks to all of us men and women of allowing God to come into the most personal parts of our lives and cut away the things that are displeasing. Circumcision uh, performed on the part of a man's body that deals with fruitfulness. And so if we are going to be fruitful, circumcision is necessary. They are circumcised, and then they celebrate Passover. Passover, of course, speaks of the lamb slain, and everything centers in the lamb being slain and the blood shed. And after they celebrate Passover, an interesting thing happens. The manna, the supernatural food let down from heaven that they had been fed with all this years of wilderness wandering, it stopped. Why? Because Deuteronomy 8, God said that he would lead them causing them to hunger and thirst, and feeding them with manna from heaven 
to teach them that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which has come down from heaven. The manna speaks of Christ, but it's beyond that too. It's learning to trust God, trust His Word. And it's interesting, Christ, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh, Christ. The manna stops. What does that mean? It's a sign, I believe, that now they are looking to move on to maturity, and with maturity, greater blessing. They've allowed God to deal with the personal parts of their lives, cut away the things displeasing. They've been reminded everything centers in the sacrifice of the lamb. The manna stops. They get the first taste of the produce of the land. But one more significant thing happened, and that's what we want to bridge last week into this week, and that is chapter 5, verse 13. Let's read it one more time. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This is Christ. This is the angel of of the Lord. One of my favorite verses of all those you find of the angel of the Lord appearing in the Old Testament is 2 Kings chapter 19 verse 35 and it simply says the angel of the Lord went out and he slew 185,000 Assyrian warriors, enemies of Israel. It says Israel got up the next day and they looked out and there were all the dead bodies. And the commander of the Lord's army is the one who took care of their enemies. Now, I noted and I underline it's a drawn sword. It's a drawn sword. James um, Janetide, I don't know if I butchered his last name or not, but he brought me a gift to church last week. Now, he's not part of our fellowship, but he's a part of the body of Christ. And he got a hold of me and he had met me one time years ago. And he said, I heard you launched a new ministry. I, I want to help. Now, I don't know what all that means yet. We're having lunch again soon. But he came to service last week and he brought me a gift. And I'm telling you, this is a gift. This is a gift. And it's heavy. And I could hurt you. But why would I do that? Your family. Let's keep it that way. Hey, commander of the Lord's army, he comes out with a drawn sword. It's not a sword in the sheath. It's a drawn sword. He's headed for battle. And Joshua says, are you for us? Or for our enemies? Interesting answer. Neither. And we covered that last week. Title of the message last week, Whose Side Are You On? God's not the one that moves. And here's the message there. Even Joshua, every day, must make a decision to submit to the king, the commander of the Lord's army. And if he chooses not to, God shows no favoritism. And he will hurt only himself because the Lord will not continue to fight his battles. And he will no longer have victory in life. And now we're ready for chapter 6. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out. And no one came in. The people on the inside of Jericho, even though they fear 
the God of Israel. We know that. Remember Rahab, when the spies come in, she tells these spies, oh, we know about your God. We've heard about your God for years. And they feared him. And yet they were not willing to make peace with him. And so what do they do? Shut the gates. We got walls. God can't get in here. They shut him out. Only Rahab had the faith, and because of her faith, her family ended up getting saved. So here's Jericho, all shut up. And God says, The Lord said to Joshua, See, I've delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of it, in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man, straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests, said to them, take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, have seven priests carry trumpets. So he gives them the instructions. Uh, they got it. They began to do it. Verse 12. Joshua got up early the next morning. The priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to camp. They did this for six days. Now, let me summarize just a bit. Seventh day, they're to do it seven times. And one of the things God commands them as they're doing this day after day is don't say a word. Just a little side message there. Why? Ten out of 12 spies 40 years before, because of their faithless mouths, kept a whole generation from the promised land. And so God tells this generation, don't say anything. Because all it would take is one person. Why would he have to do this again today? And why on the seventh day seven times? And have you seen those walls? There's no way we're going to have. What are we doing? This is crazy. But doing it God's way doesn't make sense to anybody else. It's a fake thing. So they march around. Seventh day, they march around seven times. Verse 16, the seventh time around. When the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent by faith. And then he says this, verse 18. You don't want to miss this. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you'll make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver, the gold, the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Seventh day, seventh time around. Sound the trumpets, people shout, walls fall, they go in. Yeah! Man, what a great victory. End of the chapter, God warns that any man who would rebuild Jericho would do so at the cost of his firstborn son. Years later, a guy did it, ignored God's prophecy, lost his firstborn son. Don't mess around with God. And then you get to chapter 7, opening line. But, whoa, stop there a minute. Early on in my Christian life, I'm at Liberty University, Liberty Baptist College at the time, one of my professors, my Bible professors, and, and I'm, I'm so green, I don't know anything. And he says, he says, he's reading this verse, and it says, therefore. And he says, he's, okay, stop. 
And he says, whenever there's a therefore in the Bible, you need to find out what it's there for. <laughs> and I'm like, I understand that. I get that one. Okay, right here. But. Whenever there's a but. But, I mean, here they are, great victory. Jericho, walls fall, they go in. But, the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. But they don't know at this point that God is upset. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the people will have to go against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it. Don't weary all the people. There's only a few men there. So about 3,000 men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai who killed about 36 of them, they chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. They're emotionally distraught. They're perplexed. What in the world is going on? Just had tremendous victory. And now this small little place called Ai, not even a walled city, and they get their tails kicked. Joshua falls down before the Lord. Oh, God, what is going on? And why did you lead us out here just to be defeated by our enemies? What about your name? And you pick it up, chapter 7, verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. Get up. Not a time to pray. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen. They've lied. They put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they've been made liable to destruction. I'll not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. And then verse 13, he says, go tell them, consecrate yourselves. That's why it shouldn't be odd or uncommon for Christians to make fresh commitments. Because it's so easy, isn't it? To mess up. Sometimes after you had a great week, and man, you're really living for the Lord, and then all of a sudden... And that's what happens here. Joshua tells them, beginning in verse 13 in the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. And God knows who's done it. God knows his name, not God knows his family. God knows everything. But Achan does not come clean. And you just go, what? But he doesn't. Verse 16, er, 16, early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward tribe by tribe. Judah was taken. The clans of Judah came forward. He took the Zerites. At this point, Achan's getting really nervous. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by family. Zimri was taken. Joshua had his family come forward man by man. And Achan, Achan was pointed out, you're the guy. Joshua says, give glory to God. That's like saying, hey, you're caught, dude. You might as well come clean. And he confesses now. Verse 20, Achan replied, it's true. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They're hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sends some guys, they go and get it. They get the loot. 
Bring it. And then you'll be happy I'll just summarize the end because they take Achan and his whole family, which tells us they had full knowledge of what he did and didn't do anything about it. And they take him out and they stone him to death. Aren't you glad you're a New Testament Christian? God had warned. You do this and you are liable to destruction. And he did it anyway. He did it anyway. You ever watch those movies? And the, and the person is heading where the monster is. And they've been warned the monster may be down there. And you go, why are you going that way? Don't you know there's a monster down there? Or whatever it is, and they're going, you're just going, are you, are you, can you really be so stupid? And you sometimes want to yell at the TV. If, you, if you're by yourself, you do yell at the TV. <laughs> are you so stupid, really? You're, don't do that. And they do it. I thought about this, and I went back to my childhood. I love sports, and ABC's Wide World of Sports, and, and, and one of their things that you see all the time. You'll remember it, because I have a little clip. I want to show it to you. Take a look. Here it is. No. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. One thing that's in my mind all these years is the skier, especially. I read up on him, and I'm not going to tell you about it, but I, it just, that was his first run. The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. That's what I titled the message. Achan experienced both. King David experienced both. String of victories, and then one night, one night he goes out. He should have been off in the battle, but he looks out. Taking a break, having to be spring. It's a spring break. A lot of people get in trouble then. Sees Bathsheba, has a one-night stand, and then one sin leads to another. In my men's group Wednesday night, and in our men's groups, this past Wednesday night, I added an extra discussion question to the section of the book that we were to read for last Wednesday, the book called All In by Mark Batterson. And here's the question that my group spent most of our time on in discussing. Here it is. If someone followed you with a video camera for a month and recorded everything you said and filmed everything you did, what do you think they would say your life is all about? And to try to get a bunch of guys to discuss that is a challenge. <laughs> but we started getting into it. And where it led us to was Hebrews 4.13, where Hebrews 4.13 tells us that in God's sight, nothing is covered. Everything is uncovered. The word really means naked before him. That took my thoughts back to the first sin ever committed. Recorded in Genesis chapter 3, our forefathers, Adam and Eve. And when they sin, and remember, they're in paradise. And it's a perfect marriage. And they don't even have clothes to buy. And it's okay. They're running around naked in paradise all day. Until they sin, and they sin, and they realize, oh, we're naked. 
We need to clothe ourselves. And they took fig leaves, which tell you they were in a hurry, man, And because the fig leaves are not fruit of the loom. And they cover themselves, and God comes. Here's what it says. God comes looking for them. And he calls out, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, well, I sinned. I realized I was naked. And so I hid. You're not getting it. You play hide and seek with your kids, you know. And you win some and you lose some. Play hide and seek with God. Here comes God. I wonder where they are. <laughs> what, what, where in the world could they be? Man, I can't find them anywhere. You can't ever win playing hide and seek with God. There is no such thing as secret sin. There's no such thing because God sees all. God knows all. And so I asked my group as we're talking about this, so why do we do it? Why do we do it? If we know God's watching, if we know we're going to be held accountable, if we know, have any sense to know that this is not good for us, why do we do it? And of all the discussion you could have, it really comes down to John chapter 3, verse 19. And here's what it says. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's it. Do you realize the evil of the love of money? I don't know if it bothers you, but if you just don't think about it deeply, the judgment on Achan can seem a little severe. I mean, come on. It's just a road from Babylonia. It's just some money, you know. I mean, come on. And he has to die? And his whole family is destroyed? I mean, you read in places like Leviticus chapter 10, and... Um, and Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, they offer unauthorized fire before the Lord, and God takes their lives. And you go, whoa. Uh, David, leading the children of Israel, uh, they've recaptured the Ark of the Covenant that's been in enemy hands for years. And here they come, and the Ark is on a cart being pulled by oxen, and the oxen stumbled, and so this Ark is tottering, and Uzzah, Uzzah, who's accompanying the Ark, he reaches out to steady the Ark. God takes his life. And you go, whoa, is that fair? That's a nice song. <laughs> Here's what I find God does throughout the scriptures. God reminds us of how holy he is and how sinful we are. I don't think we really appreciate, I'm including myself, how sinful sin really is. You know, I have a hard time really coming to terms with it, but one sin can send the person to eternal damnation. Just one. Lamentations chapter 3 says, but for his mercies we would be consumed. And so if we all got what we deserved, we'd all be damned. You say, well, I don't know, I think that's a lot of Old Testament stuff. Acts chapter 5 in the early church, what a great time to be a part of a church. And miracles are happening, and you got the best Bible teaching on the planet at the time. you got the apostles. And Ananias and Sapphira, as the Holy Spirit is moving people to sell a piece of land that they didn't really need, it's just extra, you know, and bring the money and give it to the church for the kingdom work. And Ananias and Sapphira, Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a piece of land, but when they get the money in hand, they, they, they think, well, we don't have to give all of it, do we? I mean, I know it's extra. We don't really need this, but, but and the Lord told us to do it, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep back. And one by one, they come in, and Peter has had a word of knowledge from the Lord of what they have done, and he asked him, is this the amount you sold the land for? Is this what you got for it? Yeah. God takes their life. 
You say, whoa, that's severe. <laughs> yeah. Being destroyed because we didn't honor God with our wealth. That's one of the messages in the story. Why did God want the stuff of Jericho? I'll just give you the short, but it's all throughout the Bible. The first fruits, he says, are mine. The first fruits are mine. The first fruits are mine. First fruits are mine. Every paycheck, every paycheck. I say, God, here you go. I'm honoring you. Because like David said, David said, if you get the, the heavenly perspective and the right perspective, David, when he offers to the Lord, he says, Lord, we're just offering what's yours anyway. Because we would have nothing without you. And all throughout the Bible, it's give the first fruits to God. And you know what he says? If you'll give the first fruits, I'll give you everything you need and even more. Just the opening of chapter 8. Then the Lord said to Joshua, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I've delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off the plunder and the livestock for yourselves. Matthew 6.33, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. What Achan could have had and he honored the Lord with the first fruits and trusted him. He didn't have to steal. He didn't have to cheat. He didn't have to connive. He didn't have to worry. And let me pause, and it's 12.04, so the landing gear is down, but <laughs> I'm not quite done. Let me read you 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to read two verses here. And the context of the first verse is describing a certain type of godless person, and yet they're religious. Constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. And you see them on television, and you hear them preach sometimes, and the whole motive is if you have faith and you honor God and you cannot give God, and while that's true, uh, to me, there appears to be, even more than appears to be, the motive is to get. And that's the wrong motive. Because true godliness is not a means to financial gain. But with that said, and don't let me confuse you here, listen carefully. I'm not a prosperity preacher. I don't believe in a prosperity doctrine that has a motive of if I give then I'll get rich. If I give, then I'll get the Mercedes. If I give, then I'll live in luxury. What kind of motive is that? But while I say that, and I believe that's biblical, there's some tremendous verses on the other side. Malachi, bring the whole tithe. That's the first fruits, I believe, clearly. Breathe the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. That's prosperity. Luke chapter 6. Let me read that one. And this is Jesus. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give... And it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. But with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Now, don't lose me here. I really am almost done. But you've got you to get this because I think it's so biblical. 
One of the things I love about the sheep pen of the church universal called Calvary Chapel, and you've heard me mention it, and I hope I haven't offended people, but I'm not a Calvinist. I have Calvinist brothers, Calvinist sisters, but I'm not a Calvinist. Why? Because I believe if you're a Calvinist, uh, if you believe at least in the certain points of Calvinism, such as irresistible grace, irresistible grace, in other words, uh, you ha don't have a choice. You're going to get saved no matter what. And you don't have to have a really heart for the lost because, hey, they're God's elect anyway. See, if you believe that, I think you're unbiblical because uh, you have to take out the whosoever will, will, will. I believe in the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, and I believe both are revealed in the Bible, and it's not a contradiction to say God is sovereign, but I have a free choice. You say, what does that have to do with this message on giving? Listen, I'm not a prosperity preacher because I don't want to tell people, I think unbiblically, give so that you'll get the nice car because I think you've stepped over the line and that's the wrong motive. Give so that you'll enjoy a luxurious life. I think that's the wrong motive. I believe the truth of Calvinism versus Arminianism is somewhere in the middle. That's why I love the family of Calvary Chapel, because we believe it's somewhere in the middle. And in regard to this message and Achan's sin and what he did, he didn't honor God with the first fruits. It destroyed him. You say, that seems severe. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Jesus comes to the guy we call the rich young ruler. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know the commandments. He says, I've kept those since I was a kid. And Jesus says, you got one more thing you like. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then you'll have eternal riches. And he went away very sad because he was a man of great wealth. 1 Timothy, I was just there, chapter 6, verse 5. Godliness is a means to financial gain. That's wrong. That's what he's saying. But then you get to verse 10. And he says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money. There's the rub. Have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So I believe just like the truth, Calvinism versus Arminianism is somewhere in the middle. I'm not a prosperity preacher because the motive to give is not to get. But with that said, if I give, and I honor the Lord with the first fruits, I can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. And he doesn't want us to worry. And you don't have to cheat on your taxes. And you don't have to hold back the tithe, the tenth of the paycheck. And even when it doesn't make sense on paper, and you say, well, if we honor God this month or this paycheck, we won't be able to pay our bills. God says, test me. You want to see the miraculous? You won't see it. unless you offer it by faith. When it comes down to it, there are two messages in our text for today. Honor the Lord with the first fruits. Honor the Lord with every dime of every dollar, I believe. I believe the tithe is biblical. It's not Old Testament or New Testament. It started with Abraham before the giving of the law, and you find that the rest of the way, culminating in Hebrews chapter 7, which is talking about giving to Christ, the tenth. And that's ultimately who we give to, to Christ, the ten. But the second message, don't miss it. Well, there's holding back financially from God because you're not honoring him with the first fruits. Or whether it's the pornography or the unholy relationship or whatever it is. Numbers 32, 23. You may be sure. Your sin will find you out. You can't hide from God. He sees. He knows. And the best thing to do is when the call comes and you've sinned, come clean. 
Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clear messages in this story. And thank you for the privilege that each one of us have to honor you with the first fruits. Because it's all yours. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that everything we have financially, materially, is because of you. Thank you also for a very healthy reminder that secret sin will ultimately destroy us. I pray for those, perhaps, right now, right here, there's secret sin that needs to be confessed and repented of. Lord, may your grace and mercy flow richly for those who are willing to confess and willing to turn from that sin. And Lord, thank you that you continue to go before us. Thank you for that reminder that you are the commander of the Lord's army and you want to fight our battles and give us victory. We thank you for that. We look forward to greater blessing as we continue to submit to your lead. Help us to follow you faithfully in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever. Thank Kevin again for coming to lead us in worship. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Amen.